we're wrapping this thing up and uh, I'll tell you it's always had to wrap a meeting up like this but um, wrapping it up and he's going to tie everything in together and uh, I hope that through this meeting the Lord has shown you some things I hope that the Lord's done some things for you and giving you an importance of the Christian life in the hands of Jesus Christ serving Him and looking forward to that time in the future and preparing for it. The judgment seat of Christ. All right, Brother Ingesaf, will you come on up? Okay, open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. So, uh, I've mentioned uh, maybe not today, but probably one of the other days about this climate of fear that grips our, our, our planet, actually, right now, this COVID thing. And uh, I just want to maybe help you put that whole thing in perspective. I got a book here that quotes a couple articles from um, the late 70s, talking about another thing that uh, we're hearing a lot about right now, not just the COVID, but something else that a lot of people are very fearful about, and that's climate change, okay? So just keep this in mind. These two articles, one from the New York Times, one from a Newsweek magazine, this is uh, late 70s, said this. The New York Times article said this. Some experts believe that mankind is on the threshold of a new pattern of adverse global climate for which it is ill-prepared. This climatic change poses a threat to the people of the world. This is 45 years ago. Not, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, the Newsweek, citing a National Academy of Sciences report, warned that climate change, quote, would force economic and social adjustments on a worldwide scale. Worse yet, climatologists are pessimistic that political leaders will take any positive action to compensate for this climatic change. So basically, these guys were telling us 45 years ago about this climate change thing. They were actually saying, if I was to continue on with some of this stuff, uh, that it's, uh, back then it was at the point of being irreversible. Uh, the sad thing is, back then it wasn't global warming, it was global cooling. So how can global cooling be irreversible and now all of a sudden our problem is global warming? If you've got a King James Bible, You've got a verse there in 1 Timothy 6 that says, Beware of science, falsely so called. So put everything in perspective. I'd say there is a climate of fear in this world, not just our country, but in this world. And that climate of fear is actually softening the hearts of many lost people because it's a climate of uncertainty. And there's not too many things on this planet that are certain. But the words in this Bible and the doctrine in this Bible are certain. Yeah. Eternal existence is a certainty for every soul. But will it be eternal life or eternal damnation? Why don't we, who knew through no fault of our own, live in this Laodicean age, take advantage of this climate of uncertainty and do our best to spread the gospel? To witness to other people, just to invite them to church, whatever it is that the Lord lays on your heart. Get out there and allow him to use you during the days of your salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the day you've given us. I thank you for the wonderful weather we've had this week. I know you've uh, sprinkled in a, a little needful rain from time to time. We thank you for all that as well. But I thank you for the souls in this room this afternoon, Lord. These souls that came back for more punishment that they might understand more thoroughly what it means to take and be prepared for that upcoming judgment seat of Christ. So, Lord, I pray you bless them for the sacrifice of their time and that they might uh, truly get a hold of something that will help them draw close to you and be better prepared for the judgment seat of Christ, a byproduct of which would be to glorify you and honor you on a regular basis during the days of your salvation. I ask it all in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. So, 2 Peter, chapter 1, we'll pick it up right in verse 4. 
It says, whereby, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, these promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Before we continue, let's not forget that what we're about to read in verses 5 through 8 is dependent on the exceeding great and precious promises in our Bible. Like Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Like um, 1 John 5, 13, these things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Those are exceeding great and precious promises. I don't think I've mentioned this one from the book of Philippians. Paul said, being confident of this very thing, he which hath a begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Not only is that an exceeding great and precious promise, but that's a specific reference. That's one of those 30 or so verses that I've made a notation. That's a specific reference to that judgment seat of Christ. When is God going to perform that good work on you? Until the day of Jesus Christ. How about, um, I mean, there's so many precious promises. I hope some of those are meaningful to you. I hope you've got your own set of exceeding great and precious promises. Continuing in verse 5. And besides this, give all diligence. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. There is an eight-stage process ending in charity. And I hope you remember what we read before the break about charity. Charity never faileth. It says in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let me remind you of the eight-stage clay process very quickly. Here it is. The potter has to dig the clay out of the ground. He then weathers it to soften it and cleanse it. He puts it on his wedging table, cuts it up, kneads it, and using it with the aid of that sharp wire, he wedges it so it can get to a consistency that's ready to be put on the potter's wheel. But before it can be on that wheel and shaped, he has to rest the clay. If he doesn't, it won't have the plasticity, the stretchability that it needs to withstand the shaping process. Once it is shaped, it goes through the kiln for the low firing. It's made hard and waterproof. That's important because the seventh stage is to put that protective coating on it, that glaze coat. And then finally, he puts the high-fired glaze on there. It goes back into that kiln, fired at a hotter temperature, and that's when the glaze is bonded to the surface of that vessel. That's the clay process. Okay, we're going to compare that to the eighth stage sanctification process. Now, I want to emphasize that the scriptures are telling us that first and foremost, Peter says, add to your faith virtue, right? To emphasize the fact that this is a process, I hope you realize even the faith it takes to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that building block of faith I've been given, and I'm going to add to that virtue, and then I'm going to partake of God's divine nature of knowledge. Now, if that's the way you want to build, uh, you're not going to be very successful, because by the time that gets eight stories high, it's going to be toppled right over. This is the way you and I need to build. We need to take that building block of faith and continue to grow in faith. So what are we going to do? We're going to add to our faith in this direction and actually abound in faith so that we can partake of his divine nature of virtue. And if we're going to abound in that virtue, we have to be ever growing and ever abounding in our faith. Then we can abound in virtue and then partake of his divine nature of knowledge like that. That's the idea. It is a process. And you can see the most important part of the process is faith. Now, every one of these eight stages, from faith all the way to charity, is dependent on two things. And that's why in Acts chapter 
20 that we looked at this morning when I said to Paul, I was telling that, those elders at Ephesus, I'm commending you to God and to the word of his grace. Every one of these eight stages is dependent on God's words and God's grace if we're going to grow, if we're going to allow him to process us. What you and I need to do is spend time in these words in specific ways, but specifically with a humble heart. Because God gives his grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Okay? So, all our answers are in the Bible. How do we abound in faith? By reading our Bible really deep, really deep. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is that simple. It is that plain. Are you spending time in your Bible? First of all, do you believe you have the words of God? Because the Bible tells us that those words effectually work in those that believe them. Do you believe you have the very inspired, preserved words of God? Do you believe you have the mind of Christ manifest in a book? If you do, if you really do, then I would think you might consider putting one of those on your car. Why not? Those are God's pure words. You say, well, they're kind of bold and kind of in your face, and that, that word blood, that makes people uncomfortable. Now, we just sang about it in here, and you can sing about it in here, but can you proclaim it out there? I hope so. You know, there's guys at the school Brother Sam and I went to, their vehicles are held together by these things. I mean, they might have 50 or 60 of them. On. That's a little overkill. I'm not suggesting you do that. But how about, how about putting one out there and say, you know, it's just a little bold, a little in your face. Well, how about this? Start small. Get you a scripture magnet. If you've got a plastic car like I have, then go to one of these local sign, sign shops, go to the internet, and just take your favorite verse or part of it and have it made in vinyl letters. And you can put that vinyl letter on your rear window of your car or your plastic trunk or whatever you got. That's what I had to do. Do something. Don't do it because I'm guilting you into it. Don't do it because you want to impress your neighbor or anything else. Do it because you think the Lord might em enjoy that. I will tell you without a shadow of a doubt, you may get a few people upset with you. But first of all, I'm not advocating that you put something on there like there, there's no hope in the Pope. Or turn or burn. I've seen those. Now those are scriptural, but they're not scripture. And the real power is in Scripture. Even this little thing that says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I didn't see this exact verse, but I saw that exact same size magnet. I think, Brother Sam, you got one this size on one of your vehicles. But I saw one years ago sitting next to a, a car in Walmart. And it was just sitting there. You know, you can't really read that going by the highway or when you're following somebody unless you're tailgating them. But hey, people will see that. You may get some people that are con under conviction when they hear the words of God or see them, but by and large, you'll get 10 to 1 where people say, yeah, I appreciate that. I like to see somebody taking a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Proverbs 22. I mentioned to you the doctrine of the rapture this morning, how the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. He went on to say, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, the very next verse says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, you could explain to uh, somebody lost or saved, you could explain to your blue in the face, you could do a great job explaining to them the rapture, the fact that a saved person doesn't have to go, th uh, go through the tri great tribulation. That could encourage or convict a saved person that, uh, well, I don't have to go through that, but maybe I want to get prepared for the judgment seat of Christ that follows that. Might convince a lost person, hey, I don't want to go through that great tribulation. I'm going to get saved. I'm going to go out in that rapture. So what's more effective, explaining that to them or just shooting them this one or two verses about it? I'm telling you, it's the verses. That's where the power is. It says in Proverbs chapter 22, beginning of verse 20, have not I written unto thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee? In plainer words, what the Bible is saying is that um, 
If you use these words as your counselors to make your decisions, they will make your decisions more profitable, more uh, precise, more in line with what God wants you to do. How do I know that? Because this Bible tells me, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It will, these words will shine light on the decisions you make throughout your day. Spend time in these words once you know their reliability, once you know their trustworthiness, once you know their power, then God says, I want you to use these very words with people that I send across your path. You and I, our responsibility is to read these words of God. Turn to Psalm 40. I'm going to read you three verses while you're turning there in Psalm 69. The first three verses of Psalm 69 says, Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. That's a plea. That's a, a lost person, at least a picture of a lost person, crying out for salvation. And the Lord doesn't answer him in that next two or three verses or that chapter or the next chapter. You go back 19 chapters here to Psalm 40, and it says, I waited patiently, in verse 1, for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. The earthly potter has to dig the clay out of the ground. It's a picture of faith, a picture of salvation. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And it's no different when you and I get saved, and this is what the laity see in church pews. If they're saved, this is what God is seeing, spiritually speaking, about their hard, contaminated heart. Why? Because most of those churches do not teach any doctrine. They're more of a social club that people like, you know, hey, I, I went to church today. Guess what I did? I checked the box, man. I, I probably don't have to go for a whole another month because I checked the box today. I feel really great. I sacrificed an hour of my time. I went to church. That's what I used to do for 30 years. Go to church once in a while to check that box. That's not what God wants. This is what God was looking at my heart for 30 years. I know that for certainty. You and I need to be reading our Bibles. Just like our hard, contaminated heart is just like that when God saves us, God wants to process us as well. If we're going to partake of his divine nature of virtue, it's not just about reading his Bible. We need to allow those words to soften and cleanse our hard, contaminated hearts by, wait for it, memorizing scripture. Yeah, yeah. This isn't just for Pastor Witter and his family. This isn't for Brother Angus. This is for every child of God. You need to be memorizing scripture. And you know what a blessing. Some of you are probably grandparents in here. Why don't you help your little grandchild to memorize scripture? And you can be memorizing it along with them. What a wonderful thing to do. Listen, when Paul wrote to that church at Ephesus, he reminded them that the Lord Jesus Christ loved the church, that's us, the body of believers, and he wanted to sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. These words supernaturally soften and cleanse our hard, contaminated heart. It says in Psalm 119, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You know, that heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. God wants to change that. And that's part of the process. He's going to put us through a weathering process using the washing of the water by the word of God. You know, when uh, you take these contaminants, spiritually speaking now, you take those contaminants, those rocks, those stones, those branches, you take those spiritually out of that hard, contaminated heart, it leaves a void. God wants to replace that emptiness with something pure and clean. And you tell me something on planet Earth that's cleaner and purer than the very words of God. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
partake of his divine nature of virtue to be morally upright and ethical? Yeah. Allow those words to per perform their supernatural purposes in your heart. Now, if we're going to partake of God's divine nature of knowledge, it's not just about reading and memorizing. We need to take the time outside of the walls of this building, probably on a daily basis, and just compare a little scripture with scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. Study. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If I haven't said it already, I hope to say it at least a couple more times. When you read, think, hear, or say the word shame or ashamed, I want it to trigger your mind to be thinking about that judgment seat of Christ. The fact that you could be naked and ashamed up there for any amount of time is terrifying. Do not allow that to happen to you. God doesn't want it for you, and I know that you don't want it for yourself or anybody close to you. So do something about it before it's everlasting too late. As Brother Peacock would say, get off your blessed assurance and get out there and allow the Lord to do something for you or with you and to you and all of those things. Uh, if you begin to partake of this process, it will renew your mind. The Bible says, be not uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing, of, uh, the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Boy, if you and I can partake of God's divine nature, by the way, this knowledge, how is that like the wedging? Hey, it's the word of God. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. What God is doing when we're studying the scriptures, he's literally wedging out some of those false doctrine, maybe beliefs we picked up when we were in a, a bad church or just things our parents told us or our grandparents that were false, that were contrary to these words. God wants to wedge those out of you and he will use this Bible to do it. The word of God, quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. If we're to partake of his divine nature of temperance, it's all about us being quiet with the Lord, meditating on the words of God. Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica and told them that they needed to study to be quiet. The psalmist wrote, be still and know that I am God. If you're ever looking for a place to begin studying, why don't you study that little phrase, stand still. It's a great little study. Stand still, stand thou still. Amazing what the Lord shows us when we stand still. You and I live, in no fault of our own, in this society that's a 24-7, 365. There's so many things to do. There's so many good things to do. Not to mention the wicked, evil things to do. But there's good things to do 24-7, but if we don't purpose in our hearts ahead of time that we are going to set aside some time, hopefully at the beginning of your day, to get quiet with the Lord, it's not going to happen. You have to, you have to make a plan, a written plan maybe, whatever it takes. You need to set aside some time and get quiet so that you can know God in that deeper level that he wants you to know him. I'm going to try to describe this painting to you. Very large oil canvas, primarily a big picture of this farmer kneeling down in his field to pray. Uh, you can tell it's morning because the dew is on the fields behind him and the sun's coming up in the horizon. And that's the whole painting except for these wispy clouds that fill in the background. But if you looked at those wispy clouds for any length of time, you realize that the artist had very subtly painted in the picture of two angels. One of those angels was like dropping seed into the field and the other angel looked like he was repairing or getting ready some equipment to do some of that work on the field there. What's the artist trying to convey? He's trying to say this. If you and I would take time before entering our busy day, get quiet with the Lord through prayer and or reading his words, God will send forth his angels to begin to do the work that you and I think we've temporarily neglected. I think that's a very scriptural principle. Spend time in his words. Like I said before, the entrance of thy words giveth light. You make their decisions. Get quiet. You know, not only talk to God through prayer, but allow him to talk to you when you silence your mind and be quiet. 
This is harder and harder to do as the hours of each day get later and later. Because when we wake up, we're pretty much, if you're like me, you don't have a whole lot going on in your mind. There's still things you know you think you want to do. But if your first goal is to spend some time in these words before all these other priorities start rushing into your mind, you've got a chance to allow God to speak to you. If we're to partake of God's divine nature of patience, we need to be thankful when we're going through what we seem, what might seem like inconvenient or uncomfortable circumstances. And I'll say this, when you do get to the judgment seat of Christ, you know, human nature, we're going to have all these excuses for why we did or did not do the things we shouldn't or should have done, okay? There's going to be good things we should have done that we didn't do. There's going to be bad things that we shouldn't have done and we did them. And God's going to take all of those excuses and boil them down into a couple things. Basically, it's going to be that we were not available. And we were not available because these things made us uncomfortable or they were inconvenient. And I know I mentioned that during one of the other messages. But listen, it bears repeating. Those are lame excuses at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's all our excuses boil down to. These things were uncomfortable and inconvenient, and that doesn't fly. That's not good enough. There are no excuses. James put it this way. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. God wants us to go through these pushing, pulling, stretching, uncomfortable situations and circumstances during the days of our salvation and he wants us to go through those circumstances counting it all joy <laughs> that's not our human nature let me give you an example of that there's this woman called Corrie Ten Boom Corrie Ten Boom found herself in uh, many concentration camps during World War II that's when Adolf Hitler was rounding up the Jews and those that had supported the Jews she was in this one concentration camp with her sister Betsy and uh, while she was in there, the first night anyway, she was thanking the Lord, thanking the Lord for the food they'd been given that day, for the roof over their heads, for the adequately warm clothing they had on, and a few other things. And when she finished, her sister Bessie said, well, Corey, I appreciate you thanking the Lord for all those things, but uh, I noticed you didn't thank him for the fleas in here. <laughs> her sister looks at her and says, Betsy, why would I ever thank the Lord for these fleas? You and I have both been scratching and itching all over the place ever since we got here. You expect me to thank the Lord for the fleas? Betsy reminded her sister Corey of that verse in the Bible that says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So Corey, being the surrendered saint that she was, she thanked the Lord for the fleas. Her sister Betsy never made it out of that concentration camp. She died there. Beth, uh, Betsy died there. Corey went on to live many years after that. Some 30 years after that, she's writing one of many books that she wrote. And during one of those books, she was reflecting back on this particular concentration camp that she was in with her sister, Betsy. And this thing that stuck out to her, the thing that she remembered, was that she had a tremendous freedom in that particular concentration camp to witness, to read her Bible, to share her faith, to do all kinds of things that she didn't really have in a lot of the others. Talking from some other survivors, she came to find out that the guards in that first concentration camp, they'd made a pact among themselves. Understanding that there was a flea infestation there, they made this pact that unless an absolute riot broke out, they were not going to go into those barracks and subject themselves to that flea infestation. Now, the Lord showed Corey, 30 years after the fact, why, in fact, she should be thankful for those fleas. It gave her those opportunities to witness and read her Bible and so forth. My question to you, saint, is are you thankful for the fleas in your life? Because we all have them. They are people or circumstances or things that the Lord allows in our life that seemingly to us are inconvenient. 
they're uncomfortable, they're frustrating, they're negative, let's, let's face it. But he allows them for his purposes. Paul got to the point in his life where he said, I glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Matter of fact, he got to the point in his life where he said, I take pleasure, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches and necessities, in persecutions and distresses. He said, I take pleasure in those things for Christ's sake because when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I know a lot of you think I wasted $29.95 on this thing just to have a scoring tool, but look at this. It's also an automatic decorating tool just like that. I got my money's worth. If we're to partake of God's divine nature of godliness, it's about us going through a fiery trial, a trial of the flesh. It says in Proverbs 17.3 that the fining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. I was mentioning this to Pastor earlier, but this denotes or signals a dividing point in this process. Because at this process, when that clay goes through that firing, it can no longer be shaped any further. Now, I just explained to Brother Martinez, who went into a little depth about what a potter can do with that sometimes. You can actually break that down and bust it up and grind it and use small amounts of that and put it in this raw clay, and it can be used as well as a strength of a strengthening agent, which is by small amounts. It's a great picture of a, a believer that has kind of fallen off the wagon, uh, you know, at the end of his life, maybe gotten away from God and backslidden, but maybe some of the things he has put into others up along the way is going to strengthen them to go through the process. But listen, you and I are going to go through a fiery trial, and when we go through that fiery trial, it's about us being tried in this body of flesh. What does your body want? wants what it wants. It wants it right now. It wants all it can get. That's what our body wants. How about we take advantage of the exceeding great and precious promises in our Bible? Like, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you are tempted to do something you know you shouldn't do, why don't you and I call out to God and ask him to give us the grace to resist to doing that thing? That should be our first resort, not our last resort. God wants you to resist it. You know that. Ask for his grace to do it. And then when you do resist it, you can say, okay, Lord, thank you. You gave me the grace to resist it. The glory belongs to you, not to me. I couldn't have done it without you. That's the way that works. How about this precious promise? Being confident of this... Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way for you to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That's one verse of scripture, but it's got five separate precious promises embedded in it. That's a great, a great verse. Listen, if you and I are going to partake of God's divine nature of godliness, it's about us being devoted to the Lord it's about allowing us for him to harden our character so we can resist the world, the flesh, and the devil. And if you want to dive into something really deep on your own, this one's for Brother Sam, you look up this word devoted in Leviticus chapter 27, and God has a lot to say about things that are devoted. It uses the word sanctified. It uses the word redeemed. It uses the words like, hey, once you are devoted... That's a dividing line. You are now the Lord's. And it cannot be, you know, they used to have this jubilee where you could redeem things. You could buy back stuff. Let's say you fell on hard times and you sold part of your cattle or whatever. Well, the year of the jubilee comes along, you have the right to buy that spec stuff. No, you can buy it back, but not if it's devoted. There's no turning back once you get that hardness, that firing, that devoted. And that's what God wants you to do. Be content and devoted to him. Turn to Isaiah 61. You and I, just like the pot, the vessel, you and I 
needed to partake of God's divine nature of brotherly kindness by putting on a protective coating. You may recall uh, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the fine white linen of the saints being their righteousness. Job said, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. A picture of protective coating. In the book of Ephesians, I'm sure you're familiar with the whole armor of God. And one of those pieces of armor that covers the heart is the breastplate of righteousness. That's our protective coating. Listen, in Isaiah 61, we'll read one verse there. It's going to be verse 10. Isaiah 61, 10. The Bible says, once I find it, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom uh, decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. <laughs> Listen, you and I need that protective coating. To partake in his divine nature of brotherly kindness, it's all about us being yielded to his perfect will. It's about us just being willing to do what's right and what he leads us to do. It's about us esteeming others more than ourselves, about bearing one another's burdens. Tech, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I told you that when the potter puts the clay through the high firing, the final firing, it's much hotter. And what happens is that the glaze becomes bonded to the vessel. Charity is what bonds this process together. We're going to read here in 1 Peter 4 in a second, but the Apostle Paul said this in one of his epistles. He said, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 4, 8. He says, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Skip down to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And then in verse 14 it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Really? Are you happy when you're reproached for the name of Christ? Look down at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Probably the previous page, look at 1 Peter 3.17. 1 Peter 3.17 says this, For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So two points here. Number one, we started off this meeting Friday night talking about finding God's will. And, you know, I've been talking to Brother Sam about that, and there's different ways to look at that. But whatever it is, it's the greatest thing you could do, whether that will finds you or you find it. One way or the other, you want to find yourself in the center of God's will. And it's got to do with well-doing. As a matter of fact, in this one epistle... First Peter, he talks about the will of God three times, and all three times it's associated with well-doing. And well-doing is when you are obedient to follow what the Lord is leading you to do. That is the greatest discovery you can ever make, and it's an ongoing daily discovery to find yourself hopefully in the center of God's will or very close to that center. It's a process. It's a daily thing. But look up here. I want to make sure you understand the difference between this firing. This is a trial of the flesh. You and I live in a body of flesh, and way too often we give into that flesh, don't we? When we give into that flesh and do the wrong thing, we suffer for it, and we say, okay, I can, I can endure this suffering because I earned it. I deserve to suffer. I know I did wrong, or I failed to do right. This is totally different. This is hotter why? Because God is going to give you the opportunity to suffer for doing something good. That is hard to take with the right attitude. I'll tell you what, I know that from experience. Just, just two weeks ago, I had a huge opportunity 
to suffer for well-doing. And I probably blew it most of the way. But I, through that suffering, I recognized it, and I stopped murmuring and complaining about it. Really. I mean, that is, no, that is not our human nature. You think about Acts uh, chapter 7, where Stephen's being stoned. He's being stoned to death by these Pharisees or whoever they were. And what does he say? He's not saying, Lord, stop them. They're hurting me. They're going to kill me. No, he's saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That guy's partaking of God's divine nature of charity. Listen, this is what this whole process is about. It's about serving with pure motives. I talked to Brother Bartinus about that a little bit during the break. It's, it's why are you doing what you're doing? Why did you put that scripture magnet on your car? If you want it to translate into gold, silver, precious stones, you have to have the right reason for putting it on there. Why did you get involved with the nursing home ministry, the jail ministry? Why did you hand out the gospel tracts? You know, there's a lot of things that we do. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, when you smile, when your body makes the form of a smile, it releases chemicals into your body. Those chemicals make you feel good. Now, you can force yourself to smile, and if you do it long enough, those chemicals will release, and they'll make you feel good, and then you can smile naturally. What I'm trying to get at is that sometimes our actions can take charge of our thoughts and vice versa. And I guess what I'm talking about is this well-doing, this suffering for well-doing, getting out there and doing things with the right attitude, once you recognize that you can cooperate with it, and maybe you're going to put that magnet on your car because you were guilted into it, but if you recognize, you know what, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to accept that. I'm really just going to do it because I love the Lord. And you could change your perspective and change that thing at the judgment seat of Christ from uh, wood, hay, and stubble to gold, silver, precious stones. I'm telling you, just understand, recognize these opportunities take advantage of them. This is the sanctification process. It is a process. I know it looks daunting. There's so much there. And I'm going to make it really simple for you. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to change it from an eight-step process to a two-step process. Okay? So step one is you and I absorbing the words of God. That's one through four up here absorbing the words of God. It's not that I'm going to tell you, okay, pick two or three from that column. No. The Bible says you need all four. You need to absorb God's words, and you need to do it four ways. You need to read the words of God. I'm telling you, those words are so powerful, they're so supernatural, that your mind can wander while you're reading them, and they still are nourishing that spirit inside of you. That's how powerful they are. I'm not advocating you just daydream while you're reading them. But spend time in them. When you're memorizing those words, they are supernaturally softening and cleansing your heart. What are you doing? You're submerging yourself in those words of God, that they can soften and cleanse your heart, contaminated heart. Then you need to study those words of God, allow that sharp, two-edged sword of the Spirit to do its work. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart, which is deceitful and desperately wicked. And you need the words of God because you cannot fool them, but you can fool yourself. You need to saturate every fiber of your body, soul, and spirit by resting in those words, meditating on those words. Once you have absorbed God's words, you now have the strength to get out there and be a doer of the word. And as God is shaping you and molding you, we talked about it last night, through your acts of service, you can withstand that pushing, that pulling, that stretching, because you absorb those words in those four distinct ways. You can be thankful for those seemingly difficult, unpleasant circumstances. You can be content partaking of his divine nature of godliness. You can put on your protective, your protective coating, that glaze coat, and then that can be made serviceable when you partake of his divine nature of charity. This is about you getting out there and being a doer of the word and having the right attitude as you suffer or tempted, as you yield your body to his perfect will. It's all right there. I would encourage you when this is over, you might take a snapshot with your phone and use this as a reference because I'm telling you, 
it's pretty obvious. When the potter digs the clay out, that is the beginning of this process. When you get saved, it's the beginning of this process. Can you stop right here? Yes, you can. If you are honest with yourself and will admit, I do not memorize scripture at all, then you're not going very far in this process. These stages for the earthly potter have to be done thoroughly, exactly, in order. I was telling someone earlier today, hey, I may miss a, a, a rock here or a piece of wood or something like that. And I may, I may be able to actually shape the thing. I'll probably struggle when I'm shaping it, but I can still maybe shape it. It's going to eventually show up down the way. If you don't do these things in order correctly, it will show up. The pottery may crack, it may warp, it may explode. Chances are the potter is going to discard it. Because once it gets to these final stages, you can't start over and reshape it. All you can do is small parts of it in other vessels to maybe help them. Listen, turn to Genesis chapter 2. I want to tie this whole thing up, and then I'm anxiously awaiting the conclusion from your pastor. In Genesis 2, 7, the Bible says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed in his nostrils the, left of, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's a picture of the body, spirit, and soul. God, I'm not going to take the time, but God does all kinds of things in threes. He's a three-part being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In this room, this afternoon, there's three types of Christians. If you're saved, you may be just that, just saved. You may be a Christian that's saved and also surrendered. But if you want to be a Christian that is surrendered and serving with the pure motive of charity, you need to partake of this blueprint here. I told you it took me 30 years to cross that line. I hope you're ready to cross this next line. One-time decision, daily decision, moment by moment. You can go back and forth, back and forth. Serve him with the pure motive of charity is what he wants you to do. He will empower you to do it. He will do the healthy lifting. We briefly mentioned uh, this verse in Romans that talks about God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. He's got three wills. In the book of Revelation, it talks about those that are called, those that are chosen, those that are faithful. We mentioned Gideon's army started with 32,000, ended up with 300. We read about the judgment seat of Christ, how that the works that survived the fiery trial, the works that are actually purified, they're not burned up like wood, hay, and stubble, those works will come out as precious stones, silver, and gold. I briefly mentioned this parable in the Luke 19 that talks about one of the potential earned inheritances, earned rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, and that's to rule over many cities out into eternity and through that millennial reign. I told you clay is the single most abundant solid material on planet Earth. Potters divide all that clay into one of three categories. Earthenware, the most common, the least expensive, fired to the lowest temperature. Stoneware, which most production potters like myself use, it's rarer, it's harder, it's more expensive, but then there's the ultimate clay of clays called porcelain. Porcelain is the whitest, the smoothest, the purest, the rarest, the most expensive, and it's fired to the highest temperature. Porcelain has a very unique quality in that when a master potter forms a vessel out of porcelain and he's able to do so very thinly, porcelain becomes translucent, meaning that light shines through it. That's a wonderful picture of a surrendered column three Christian. Paul talked about surviving, he talked about striving. I'll tell you what the mantra in today's Laodicean churches is. It's eat, drink, and be merry. I'm saved, I'm just looking to survive. I was listening to a sermon this morning and that, that was this guy's attitude. It was like, hey, I just wanna barely squeak by. I just barely wanna get into heaven. Boy, if my pastor in Tennessee heard that, he'd, he'd have a raging fit. He's all about Christians being a Christian seven days a week, not Sunday morning. 
and then Monday you just go back and live like the world. I, I hope you're a seven day a week Christian. I will tell you this, forget about just surviving, okay? You're born again, you're gonna survive. If you would get outside of that comfort zone, allow yourself to be slightly inconvenienced and strive just a little, little bit, before you know it, you'll vault right over here and you will thrive as a believer. You will absolutely thrive because you have God living inside of you and he is going to do all the heavy lifting. You just need to be that vessel yielded to his service. Just let go and let God, that's that message. Listen, the Apostle Paul said, my brethren, he said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul likened the Christian life to a race. And of course, we all know it's more like a marathon. And within that marathon is an obstacle course. And God has designed a race for every single soul he has ever created. It's your individual race. You're in that by yourself, but with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, by God's grace, I'm going to finish my race. And with his help, if he desires, I'm going to seek for that prize. Column three is not just for Pastor Witter. It's not for Brother Martinez. It's for every single child of God that's ever been created. Of course, you've got to get saved to get on the board. But once you're on the board, God wants you over here. He wants you to serve him with a pure motive of charity. He wants you to allow him to perform his perfect will through your faithfulness, just like Gideon's 300 did. He, he would like your works to come through that fiery trial as gold. He'd like you to rule and reign over cities out into the millennium and into eternity. He'd like you to be like that fine piece of translucent porcelain where the master potter can look down at the surface of that vessel and actually see his reflection of his face on that surface. He wants you to thrive during the days of your salvation that he can have the blessing of giving you the prizes, your earned inheritance at the judgment seat of Christ. This is a process. God will help you all get right there if you'll follow this blueprint. That's what it is. Try to remember these two verses. Apostle Paul said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, he said, if I do it without charity, it profiteth me nothing. And then Peter said, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That barren, that unfruitful, that reminds me of Revelation 3 that we read about being naked and ashamed. For the last time, I'm going to say it, God does not want you to stand before him one day being naked and ashamed. He does not want you to spend the days of your salvation being barren and unfruitful. So step outside of that comfort zone, allow him to do something with you. You will please him, you will glorify him while you were created, and at the side benefit, you will be better prepared to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you for these pictures. Thank you for these doctrinal truths. Help us to take advantage of them, Lord, that we may, during the days of our salvation, do some of these things you created us to uniquely do for your purposes and your pleasure. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Witter. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. I don't know about you, but I want some precious homes. I want some silver. I want some gold. Most of all, I want Jesus Christ to look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. I want to enjoy the fellowship with my Lord. I want to enjoy that. And you don't enjoy that unless you go through the fire with Him. You, you do not get through it by yourself. You're not going to get through it on your mind. You get through it by yielding to Him. Let Him take you through it. All, every one of these things apply with it. All that stuff being like Him. Well, you're going to have to yield. And you're going to have to be purified and sanctified. And you're going to have to go through that fire with Jesus Christ to be like Him. That's where we need to strive to go to. The Christian life 
is one of taking the next step. You've got to figure out what's the next step that God wants from you. Now, if you're past salvation, it's going to be require some work on your part. Salvation's free. The next step is work. It comes work. You're supposed to add to your faith, as he showed. Add these things. You should do that. All right, let's have a song of invitation. The Lord spoke to your heart, and you need some time in prayer. Feel free to come down here and pray. Sit in your pew and pray. And uh, just allow the Lord to do something in your life today.